Okay, great, hi, welcome. Uh, thanks for allowing me to uh, speak to you today. Um, so this is actually not a joke, uh, but it'll make sense uh, in a few minutes, the sub-basement of RL. So let me start by setting the context for what I want to talk about. Uh, this picture, we all know this picture. Uh, this is the single most dangerous picture in all of AI. Uh, <laughs> every introduction to RL starts with this picture, and the reason it's dangerous is that there is a deception. This makes the RL problem look simple, right? It's just so simple. There's two boxes, two arrows. You know, there's a little agent, an environment. It emits some actions, gets some observations, rewards back. You know, simple problem. Should be a simple solution, okay? Uh, the difficulty with this is that it masks an immense array of subproblems. And in fact, it's, uh, I've always found it difficult, but I, I would claim it is difficult to really wrap your head around the scope of this problem by only thinking of it at this level of abstraction. So uh, just to kind of narrow down a bit to what I want to talk to you about today, let me start to kind of peel off layers of complexity that are embedded in a problem like this. Now, the first one or two are maybe a bit of a cheat. You probably weren't thinking of them, but uh, the first layer of complexity is multi-agent interaction. So you look at this environment, you say, oh, it's, it's an oblivious universe, unaware of the presence of the agent in it. Well, we didn't say that, right? The environment could easily consist of other agents. Those other agents may indeed be aware of your hapless little agent. They could be helpers, they could be enemies, they could be cooperating, there could be coalitions. Who's a friend today might be an enemy tomorrow. Uh, the complexity of trying to think about the learning problem in this context is this inherent non-stationarity of multi-agent interaction. Right, so whatever you think you can trust today and do effectively today might be completely different once the market has absorbed whatever's happening out there and things change. Now, uh, I admit you probably weren't thinking about this, but this is a legitimate, very important uh, area of research and investigation under RL. And indeed, we'll be seeing a, you know, several presentations about multi-agent multi -agent interaction shortly. So let's assume, though, that we didn't really intend this. So we'll peel away this layer of complexity, simplify it down to the simple problem we should really be studying. Well, here's another thing that we actually deceived you with in this picture, partial observability. So uh, that environment you're in could be arbitrarily complicated. It's the universe, right? And our, our little agent is endowed with a couple of, you know, sensory, uh, you know, some sensory apparatus and a few modalities, but maybe a very sparse, limited uh, ability to understand the state of the universe, okay? Uh, this, of course, I think as you saw this morning, introduces yet another level of complexity to the problem, having to do with actually constructing a memory uh, that allows you to make effective decisions in the environment. Uh, just to make it concrete, uh, you know, most of you right now uh, are in a state of trying to, you know, figure out, A, why am I here and what am I getting out of this? But also you're in a state right now currently where it's like you're thinking about how do I get home, where do I live, how do I get to the airport? Point being, none of that context, all your commitments, all the things you have to be doing right now, none of that is in front of you right now. It's not listed on the screens for you to like not use your memory. You have to construct a memory of your context in which to decide how to act. Okay, and we saw some lectures last week indeed talking about how you might uh, learn how to construct memories. Super important problem, super central, not simple. Okay, probably when you see this picture, you're probably thinking of this somewhat more standard problem where we simplify it one further level by assuming uh, complete observability. That is the universe or the environment is simple enough that if I just look at it right now, I know everything I need to know. History is irrelevant. Everything I need to know about how to act in the future is summarized by my current immediate observation. We uh, typically will call this the Markov state assumption. Uh, a state is Markov. If given the state, the future is independent of the past. Okay? So, you know, fair enough. Probably you were assuming it was this level of complexity of problem we were facing, and maybe this is the base level that we really need to understand to kind of get, you know, our feet under us and up and running and start building agents and towering edifices of demonstration glory. Well, there are actually still many layers of complexity even in this sort of canonical MDP style problem. The next one, which uh, should be more familiar, I think, because it's come up already, is exploration. So we're asking our agent to figure out how to interact in the world, but unfortunately, the data it's getting to learn from is controlled by its own decisions, okay? And so we hit this, you know, now very famous exploration exploitation trade-off, which is like sometimes you have to execute actions not because you're going to gain anything by it, but you're going to learn something by it. 
On the other hand, we can't just sort of uh, be executing information gathering actions all the time, right? We might starve or die or stop breathing. Uh, so we do have to exploit now and then, and there's this subtle balance. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting problem. And I think you've already seen some coherent ideas on how we might approach that problem. So maybe this is the base level we have to consider. Well, I'm gonna argue actually there are actually multiple layers still down to some base level where I, I feel like the whole enterprise is kind of founded. So let me sort of take it down one further level. Imagine I remove the exploration problem from our poor agent. What does that mean? It means either give it a, a simple model or I just give it some data and say, that's it, right? You're not gonna get more data. You're not gonna get uh, like another model. That's it, you know everything you need to know. So there is no inherent exploration problem, but there is still a lot of complexity here. In particular, having to do with this, uh, you know, the, the fundamental properties of sequential decision making. So if I give you data about like say, you know, Go games or some sequence, you know, episodes in some environment, uh, you have this temporal credit assignment problem. You could look at the sequence of decisions or actions that were taken, and it's actually very tricky and very difficult to figure out, well, which, if any of those decisions were responsible for a good outcome or a bad outcome. That's the retrospective view. The same problem arrives in the prospective view, which is this concept of future value. So when I'm deciding how to act right now, there is indeed a trade-off between short-term immediate reward, the thing that's most rewarding right now, like eat that donut, versus long-term consequences, right? And this, uh, uh, this uh, point that we're actually affecting the state of the environment, not just gaining reward. Uh, I will now argue, and I'll come back to this later, that this also is an extremely complicated problem. And in fact, there is a more fundamental problem below even this. Uh, and what's odd about this, and maybe what's a little bit off kilter about this presentation perhaps, is that uh, the thing below this, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna teach you some things about it, and I'm gonna claim that this really is sort of a foundational level, but it is, uh, without trying to be offensive, neglected, I think, in a lot of the treatments and introductions to machine learning and reinforcement learning, and uh, I'll make that point shortly. So what can possibly be below uh, sequential decision-making, exploration, partial observability, and multi-agent interaction. Well, the simple problem of just figuring out how to optimally act. That is, there is no exploration. I give you fixed data. There is not even sequences. What if it's one shot, right? Here's a situation, what do you do? Here's another situation, what do you do? No future consequence, but what really matters is can you execute actions that get you high reward, yes or no, okay? This is a base, base, basic problem that I argue is the sub-basement of reinforcement learning. Uh, it's at this level, down in the sub-basement, where I sense in my own education and the education of others that it's somewhat neglected, but it actually supports the whole uh, enterprise. And it's also the level at which we actually see the connection to the rest of machine learning that you've been sort of learning things about. It's where we see the direct connection to supervised learning. It's where we see the direct connection to many concepts in well, latent variable inference and estimation uh, and statistical concepts. So uh, my plan for today is quite simple, is I'm just gonna introduce you to some of the issues that come up at this sub-basement level. Use this as a way to connect to things you already know. And in fact, I'm gonna claim you already know how to solve this problem, but you were not shown how to solve it in the way I'm gonna present it. Uh, but uh, you're prepared to do it if only you connect the dots. Okay. So that's the agenda. Okay, so when I strip away all the complexity, we get to this base problem of how do you like sort of solve optimal one-step decision making or how do you like optimize a policy? We get this uh, very simple basic problem, you know, one-step uh, optimal decision making or batch policy optimization. I think the best way to proceed with this is just to start with a simple picture, okay? Imagine the following problem. I give you data. What is that data? Uh, what if I just give you a set of contexts? Let's call those x1 to xm. And let's say for simplicity, at least initially, there's just some fixed finite set of actions, a1 to am, okay? What is the data? The data is simply, well, you know, in context x1, you or somebody somehow tried action a2 and we saw reward r1, right? Oh, does my little pen work? Yeah, okay. And then, you know, context uh, x2, we tried action a and we saw reward 2, so on and so forth. What's our problem here? We just need to take this data, that's it, and we need to infer a policy, right? A policy uh, that it, you know, sort of achieves maximum expected reward, but the catch is we actually don't care about this data. What we care about is future data, future contexts drawn, say, from the same distribution, okay? Very basic problem. Uh, let's see if I can get this widget up here. Oh. 
All right, uh, so before I start kind of, you know, racing ahead and telling you how to face this, uh, I actually think it's healthy to actually to think about this problem because it's very close to things you have encountered, like, for example, supervised learning. We'll see the connection more tightly shortly. But it's actually also different, and there's a lot of subtlety here. So uh, to be more concrete, what is a policy? A policy is a mapping, right? Oh, let me change the color. One moment. Okay. A policy is a mapping from a context to a probability simplex or a probability vector over a set of actions, later a density over a space of actions, okay? So we, we have some policy representation, some parametric model, a neural network uh, that consumes contexts, produces probability vectors over the actions, okay? It's a parametric model. We get this data. All we got to do now is optimize the parameters of that model to do something. What do we need it to do? Well, what we need it, well, what we'd like it to do is sort of produce distribution so that on future test contexts we haven't seen, we put high probability on the actions that get high reward. That's what we want to do, but we have to train those parameters on this data and this data alone, okay? Uh, here's some of the subtlety. Uh, we know intuitively that we, you know, by changing the parameters of the neural net, what we're doing is in a particular context is we're shifting the probability mass over different actions, okay? And Perhaps you might assume that what we really want to do in this data is somehow shift the mass by, you know, changing the parameters of the model to maybe get the mass concentrated on some of the high reward outcomes. And perhaps we want to shift the mass to avoid some of the low reward or detrimental outcomes. Now, what's high? What's low? We didn't, I didn't give you a prior, right? There's just data. So you might say, okay, maybe in the data there was like the max reward we saw, it might be this one, and maybe in the data there was the smallest reward we saw, it might be this one, and presumably they're different, because if they're all the same, not clear what we're doing right now. Um, okay, and then how much mass do you shift on to the high reward action, and how much mass do you shift off of the low reward actions? And where do you strike the balance, okay? Uh, just to be a little clearer, there are of course a few extreme options, okay? Notice that we can, you know, if we have a fairly rich neural network, we can shift the mass in this matrix pretty much anywhere we like, okay? This will sound dumb, and it probably is, but, you know, for example, we could shift the mass to avoid every action that was actually in the data. This is called wild-eyed speculation, right? Maybe the big rewards are out there, we just haven't seen them yet, so let's ignore the data. Uh, okay, probably not a great strategy, but the opposite extreme isn't that great either. What's the opposite extreme? The opposite extreme is, let's put all of our mass on the data, right? So we'll optimize the parameters of the model to kind of, you know, concentrate all the mass on exactly the action choices that were made in the data. What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is the rewards don't matter anymore. All we're trying to do is uh, what's called behavior cloning. We're just trying to replicate the decisions made by whoever or whatever made those decisions that gathered the data, okay? Is that a good idea? Well, I didn't say, by the way, uh, that this data came from a good source. It came from a source. It could have been a previous U, right, or a previous instantiation of the agent. It could have been just collected by a bunch of different agents. Uh, you can imagine, you know, these days perhaps you might work at a large internet company, say, where you, you just log terabytes and petabytes of data that looks like, oh, here's a user, here's a context, here's some action we executed, like showed something to the user, and here was an outcome. Terabytes and terabytes of it. Now, the serving policy that gathered that data, well, you know, it depends. When did we get the data? Was it a week ago, a month ago? Was it from a year ago? You know, the policy keeps changing. So, you know, just behavior cloning itself uh, is quite limiting. And, of course, the other thing we know that behavior cloning is going to do is it's not going to do better than the thing that already is in operation. Okay? What we want to do is policy improvement. We want to take this data and infer a policy that's as good as we can make it, in particular, at the very least, better than the thing that gathered this data. Okay, so it's actually a pretty clear challenge. I would claim this is the machine learning problem, like, you know, the machine learning 101 type problem that we never teach in machine learning 101, uh, because uh, partly we don't have simple answers to this. It is quite a simple, uh, subtle problem. Uh, and it's kind of flown under the radar. I think it's kind of this thing that's below the radar in RL and below the radar in like the rest of machine learning. Uh, but it's very fundamental and it's a, a way to connect these areas. Okay, so I'll quit uh, just pontificating and, and move on. So, uh, to start to make sense out of this task. Uh, well, we can organize our thinking a little bit by, you know, realizing there are pretty much, you know, there could be others, but sort of three basic issues we'd like. 
right? One is there really is a generalization problem. So just to remind you, we actually don't care about how good your policy is on this data. What we care about is how good that policy is on future data drawn from the same marginal distribution over X, right? We want to improve your serving policy and now launch it into the world and serve humanity, right? Uh, so we really need to generalize or uh, uh, identify regularity in this data that allows us, just like the rest of machine learning, to capture structure that is predictive or useful outside of this very particular data set, okay? So we want the neural net to sort of uncover the latent structure that explains, say, for example, the rewards given the action choices and context. Generalization is key. In fact, generalization should be thing number one, not an afterthought. It's really what we want to do here. Okay, but uh, once we accept that as an issue, uh, there are going to be sort of two more mechanical issues to face. Uh, the next issue is optimization. So, okay, unless you're a truly committed Bayesian, and it's really hard to be truly committed, uh, but, uh, you know, probably what we're going to have to do is, is somehow formulate an optimization objective over this data and then pull gradients through it and optimize the parameters of our model and achieve glory, okay? So we're going to have to decide what is the optimization objective we really want to bring to bear, and it is not straightforward, I claim. Uh, the other issue, which is actually the elephant in the room, is there's a lot of missing data here. In fact, most of the data is missing. Uh, I deliberately chose one action in each context because, frankly, that's life, right? There was a context, you chose an action, there was an outcome. Mostly, that's the end of the story there, and you just see this endless variety of new contexts. Uh, clarification question, Dr. Bowling? So, uh, did you have this data? Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> almost there. Almost there. Okay. That wasn't a clarification. Uh, all right, so before uh, we move on here, uh, there is yet another elephant in the room. Okay, so missing data is another part of the challenge. But there is, there is an elephant in the room, and in fact, this is such a fundamental problem. You might be presuming, and some of you are actually probably already jumping up in size, like, oh, 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 I know how to solve this problem. Uh, or you might be asking your question, like, how is this not known, right? It's such a basic thing, like, this is a solved problem, right? We know how to do this, we know what we're doing underneath, you know, like in the boiler room of reinforcement learning. Uh, well, and in fact, the answer, well, there's sort of two, but let me sort of highlight one of them. The default answer that many of you are thinking about right now, or at least some of you, is, ah, tut, 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 we know what we're doing here. We want to just simply importance correct the observed rewards uh, and formulate an unbiased estimate of the expected reward of the policy and then just optimize that. It solves all the problems for us. We, we're really not fighting with missing data. We're really not worrying about the optimization objective. It's just known, don't waste my time, okay? Uh, and here it is now, there's a bit of a detail here, which is that also requires a bit of a cheat, which is, okay, secretly, we weren't just logging the rewards in all these contexts, we were secretly also logging the proposal probabilities. Whatever mechanism that was gathering the data, we asked it to tell us the probability you chose this action in this context, and hope it wasn't zero or one, okay? Uh, and so we log these proposal probabilities, so let's call them beta, uh, and then we just simply correct by dividing by beta the rewards, uh, and then formulate this little, uh, you know, this little widget formula here, which is an unbiased estimate of expected reward, and then just optimize that, and we're off to the races, right? Like reinforce, like all of these sort of standard policy optimization-based techniques. In this batch offline case, kind of reduced to this. So uh, why isn't this just the answer? Uh, well, it, it isn't just the answer, because I'm, I'm going to tell you about that, but, um, but it does some things okay. So uh, when we go back and, and hold this uh, sort of baseline or default approach up to the three things we care about, generalization, optimization, missing data, on the topic of generalization, I actually don't have a lot to say about this, neither good nor bad. It's, it's, I don't have any clear evidence it doesn't generalize well. Uh, there is some evidence that other techniques generalize a bit better, and I'll show you some of that uh, a little later, but it's pretty nuanced and subtle, and it's, it's not an overwhelming thing. What's overwhelming is that that objective has made two commitments, a commitment to an optimization objective and a commitment to how you're going to treat missing data, and in both of those commitments, I'm going to claim and show you that it has made a very poor choice. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that it's made a very poor choice and that you already know that and that in part of your training, machine learning has already shown you how, for this optimization question, you would never do this. This is not an effective choice. So step one is to teach you, or to remind you that you already know how to do this better than that, okay? 
Uh, and second issue is in terms of a treatment of missing data, again, somehow neglecting the rest of machine learning statistics, which thinks awfully long and hard about how you do inference over missing data, this uh, approach is, uh, I can't think of a polite word, but anyway, uh, unsatisfactory. Okay, so uh, that's our goal. Two parts, sort of two little sub-lessons. Um, how should we choose an optimization objective for training? What should that be? What should it do? What should it not do? And, uh, and then, once we get that under control, uh, how are we going to deal with the missing data problem? And do we actually have some reasonable, rational, uh, rational ways to approach this? Okay. Uh, oh, optimization objectives. Okay, so I want to isolate the two issues, the, the optimization objective and the missing data inference problem. And the generalization, okay, let's assume the generalization is solved by fiats because neural networks are magical things that can like uncover latent structure and data and it's just going to work, okay? Uh, but I want to isolate the optimization question and the missing data question as requested by Dr. Bull. Uh, and so, to isolate the optimization question, let's simplify further and say you have complete data, okay? So we had a list of contexts, we had a list of actions, and in every row, we have logged somehow what was the reward if you counterfactually took this action in this context for every action, every context in the data. Great. And now, uh, we look at our, our target objective, and indeed, we do agree. What we actually want to do is to maximize the expected reward. We want to train our policy to maximize the expected reward. Now, actually, not necessarily on the training data. We want to have, you know, maximize the expected reward on future data. But, you know, empirical risk minimization, like if we can, you know, optimize the expected reward on the empirical sample from the data, you know, it's a reasonable proxy for doing it, uh, you know, on, on the full distribution. Fine. So, uh, done, right? Um, not so fast. So uh, this optimization objective, which we agree is what we actually want to optimize, okay, is profoundly problematic. In fact, in all of machine learning, you will struggle to find a worse optimization or training objective than this one, okay? Uh, now, there are a couple of things. I'm going to unpack it a little bit for you because I'm going to need to build up some building blocks that I'll bring together later. Uh, this thing uh, has plateaus everywhere. It, it's nearly a piecewise constant optimization landscape, which means you're going to see zero gradients declare victory, but you're going to be off in some terrible, terrible policy somewhere with no training signal, no hope of finding anything good, and, and we'll discover this shortly. It also has other, you know, cute little effects, like it's pretty easy as an adversary to embed structures where I can create exponentially many local maxima, exponential in the number of features and the number of actions and so on and so forth. You can embed like these kind of interference patterns and you can just make a, a, as bad a landscape as you'd like. So it's got both things going for it. The landscape can be flat everywhere almost and it can have like bumps and valleys and you can build them up into sort of a, an array of complexity. There is no algorithm that is going to tear through that complexity and find a reasonable solution. In fact, it's provably hard, okay? Uh, we did this to ourselves. Now, I, I, I'm not advocating that we give up on that objective, but I'm just trying to get some maturity to recognize that what you want versus how you train are not the same thing, okay? Um, actually, I'm going to skip this. I might have to come back to it, but there's a little bit of the math underlying, uh, but maybe I can just move on. Uh, okay. What you want and how you train are not the same thing. Uh, and here's what's curious about this, and it's, it's mystified me for the last year or two, is that you already know this. You already know this because this is essentially the supervised learning problem. This is the first problem you learned in machine learning. Um, and when you learned how to solve that problem, you actually never optimized the thing you cared about. What do I mean? Okay. Let me just specialize that picture a tiny little bit to bring it into something that you actually indeed must have seen by now, right? Supervised classification learning. Supervised classification learning is a sub-problem of what we've been talking about, where the rewards are just simplified to being either zero or one, and it turns out there's a single reward of one in each row, the class label, okay? Uh, and our expected reward objective is expected accuracy. And let us all agree, for the sake of argument, that we want to train our neural network to maximize expected accuracy on test data. No problem, no controversy, okay? That's not the point. The point is, you never trained your neural network this way for this problem, all right? 
How did you actually train it? You didn't train it to maximize r.py. You actually trained it to maximize r.logpy. r.logpy is not r.py. Okay? You were tricked. Now, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly everyone's educational background. It may have just been handed to you. Like, oh, here's the MNIST demo. Download the code. Yep, here's the log likelihood. Yeah, yeah, Fisher, 100 years ago, statistics, you know, statistics, mumble, mumble. It's the right thing to do. Off you go, maximizing r.logpy. Okay? And yet, maybe it, it was below your attention, you measured the actual training and test accuracy on the side while you were optimizing this proxy objective, okay? Here's the other thing you already know, you've already seen it, is that even though you want to minimize uh, training error or, or maximize training accuracy, you would actually do a much better job of it by not minimizing it directly, but by, uh, sorry, not optimizing it directly, but by optimizing the surrogate. What I mean is you want to maximize training accuracy, and the way you maximize training accuracy is optimize something else, but the result you get by optimizing something else is going to be a lot better than the result you get by directly optimizing the thing you're trying to optimize. This is already like machine learning 101. It's just accepted. In supervised learning, we don't even think about it. That's the problem, by the way. We don't even think about this. We use surrogates all the time. Okay? Yet somehow in machine learning, or sorry, reinforcement learning, we, miss, you know, we drop some of the observations and we just swap right back to saying, nope, got to maximize directly the thing we care about. Uh, how can this be so? How is minimizing uh, or maximizing r.logpy better than maximizing r.py, even when we measure r.py? Well, what's going on here is that uh, this, this surrogate function, r.logpy, is not arbitrary. In fact, it shares some very useful properties and some relationships to r.py. In particular, if we look at the output layer of the neural network, so you, you know, consume the context and then you produce this score vector across actions, which is just a bunch of numbers, which then get converted by like the softmax transfer, which I've kind of buried down here. You, you convert the, probability, uh, the, the vector of scores to probabilities by exponentiating and normalizing, okay? But uh, when we're training the neural net, we're basically training, right, that output layer of scores, which are then, like, you know, backpropagated through to send the training signal to the network. From the perspective of that final output layer, the score layer, the top objective is, as I've already described, a horrific objective, nearly piecewise constant, exponentially many local maxima, potentially. Uh, but the r.logpy, from the perspective of the scores or the logits, is a convex function which means that if you've trained a good representation in a lower layer of the neural network, the fine-tuning at the top layer is totally reliable, never fails, finds the globally optimal solution every time. Okay? Uh, it's kind of like this. We have, you know, bad landscape. And somehow, by switching from r.py to r.logpy, we have created somehow a better landscape that looks like this. Okay, so if you're out here on some plateau, if you're in the target objective, you will stay on that plateau forever or nearly forever or a very long time, okay? But if you happen to be using this surrogate, right, you uh, rapidly and reliably converge to a good solution. There's something else here going on, though, is that actually the r.logpy wasn't that arbitrary. It shares a relationship to r.pi. In particular, the global minimizer of r.logpy is going to actually match the global minimizer of r.pi. Now, uh, when you can realize it, like in the limit of arbitrarily large numbers. Point being is that we really have done this. We've taken a very difficult landscape and we've just constructed or you know, engineered another landscape that's much more trainable that preserves the solution as long as we have enough capacity in our neural network, right, so that we're not sort of hitting these frustration, like uh, the sort of the representation frustrations, okay? Sounds good, sounds reasonable, and in fact, it works. It works so well, we don't even teach you about what's going on. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and that's this calibration property. So more mathematically, you can say for any, you know, target accuracy in the, in the true objective you care about, there's going to be some proxy accuracy that if you achieve it, you guarantee the same thing in the target. So it's actually principled, it's sound, it's good computing science, okay? Uh, and, oh, yeah, the other thing I wanna make, uh, other point I wanna make is uh, typically in a machine learning 101 course, uh, unless you happen to wander into mine, uh, you probably never even tried this thing 
at the top as a training objective. Uh, but I actually generally try to force my students to try it. Uh, see for yourself, okay, what happens. Um, point one is it's perfectly differentiable. There is no reason why you couldn't do it. In fact, you just change one line in your TensorFlow script or whatever, just swap the loss function out, the gradients flow fine, you attempt to train the thing you care about and you discover it's very difficult to get this to work and then you swap back to the original line in the code and you discover it works amazingly well. Uh, you can try this yourself, it's not a big deal, but I tried it for you. Uh, and I don't know if you can see these graphs, but this is sort of what it looks like. The yellow line is what you get by trying to optimize on MNIST, say with a single fully connect, you know, hidden layer, fully connected neural network or something, right? Uh, if you try to directly optimize expected uh, reward, uh, you do indeed see the plateaus, right? When you're watching the training curve, it saturates, and then you might think like, well, that's victory, we've converged. And then out of the blue, boom, it plummets into another valley. Okay, and they say, okay, this time for sure it's got it, right? And then you watch and then it, boom, it'll drop into another valley. Ultimately here, it just had like two drops. Ultimately, this thing, and I've run here, it says 200 epochs, I've run this for 1,000, it never gets out of here. It never trains uh, to zero misclassification error. Yet, the same model, same data, you just swap the loss function to r.logpy and you get the blue curve, which by the way, by epoch 25 has zero training error. Not a single misclassification in the data set. The neural network has the capacity to fit the data. You need to give it a landscape that you can actually optimize. Okay, we know this. Supervised learning, I mean, you know, this is how we survive, okay? Uh, and I think the point of what I'm trying to do here is kind of clear is that I'm just trying to remind us that this is relevant to reinforcement learning, at least down in the sub-basement. If you're trying to optimize a policy on uh, a given set of data, yes, we care about expected reward. No, you don't choose that as the optimization objective, or you get what you deserve, okay? Uh, okay, now, uh, just to close this off, now I cheated a bit, so this was sort of, the story here is about this simple case of zero one reward, but uh, you may have detected we left the more general case of like, you know, general reward. Um, this is often called the cost sensitive classification problem. It's an important problem. Strangely small literature compared to the other literatures. Don't quite get that, but it's a, it's a core problem, very important to both RL and ML. Uh, where we're just trying to optimize our policy or classifier, right, to maximize expected reward, where we see arbitrary reward vectors. So sometimes, you know, in a different context, there are different trade-offs you want to make. Uh, and indeed, there, are, there is some, you know, beautiful theoretical work that sort of designs surrogate objectives that are convex at the top layer, uh, that have a calibration property, which means they preserve the global minimizer, assuming sufficient capacity, that you can reliably train uh, to maximize like uh, expected reward by uh, optimizing a surrogate, okay? Uh, the year on this, this is Bernardo and Chaba, you know, brilliant, not long ago. Uh, the year on this is uh, depressingly recent, like this, you know, you would hope there'd be a 19 in front of that, but uh, anyway, uh, but you know, it's kind of under control. And I, all I wanna share with you now is that uh, it's out there, but there are actually a lot of ways to go about this. Uh, so I didn't tell you, I'm not telling you what objective really, that you, to choose. I'm telling you, you're choosing an objective. And that should be a con conscious choice and there are consequences, okay? Uh, it turns out that there's a whole, it's, it's, once you think of it this way, there's a whole space of objectives. It gets to be really easy to start to make up objectives and uh, some of them are kind of elegant and I wanna kind of use these because I think they fit into a lot of the other uh, machinery I wanna sort of reveal. So what if we take our expected reward objective and then we cheat a little bit, we just smooth it. One of the problems with r.pi is that the true optimal pi actually becomes a one-hot vector, right? A deterministic policy that, uh, you know, accumulates all of its probability mass on the single best choice or evenly between the best choices. Um, you know, that's a little bit messy. It really does give piecewise constant landscapes and so on. Uh, what if we just add a little bit of entropy regularization? So this cost function down here is like a regularizer. It just kind of smooths it out. The beautiful thing about this is that if you add entropy regularization with a, a regularization coefficient tau, that's actually gonna be a temperature. The optimal policy now becomes like an exponentiated normalized distribution. So it, it spreads the mass in an interesting way and smoothly, right, uh, given the target reward vector. It does, however, introduce a little bit of bias, right? So by smoothing, we do give something up, right? We're no longer gonna get a one-hot solution. We're gonna get a slightly smooth solution. So we're gonna give a little bit up, 
But the good news here is, is that how much we're giving up, or the bias, if you will, is totally controllable by tau. And if you want less bias, we can bound it. Uh, and you, know, you just make tau as close to zero as you like to get the bias as small as you like. Okay? So I'm going to say it's a friendly extension. Uh, now, adding entropy regularization does not solve the landscape problem. It kind of smooths it a bit, but really most of the problems I've already revealed to you still uh, are still there. Okay? It's still very difficult to train. Um, but it allows us now to connect to a lot of other tools and techniques from AI, or I'm sorry, machine learning and statistics uh, that I think give us a space of things to consider. So here's something interesting that happens, is that entropy regularized expected reward is actually equivalent to minimizing a KL divergence between the output your policy and a hidden distribution P that we never talked about, but it's the optimal distribution implied by the reward vector and the, uh, you know, the entropy regularizer. So imagine, and, and this is mathematically equivalent, that we could think of our optimization objective as, oh, first we're gonna invent a target distribution across the rewards, and that target distribution is gonna be like, okay, divide by temperature, so rescale the rewards, exponentiate, normalize, declare that to be a target distribution, and then we're just gonna train our policy distribution to minimize the KL divergence to that target distribution, okay? Still not a good landscape from an optimization perspective because, okay, KL is convex in its arguments, but really what matters is the convexity with respect to the network underneath, in particular the scores, okay? So it's still a difficult landscape, but now we have a hook. For example, we notice that this KL is not a symmetric function, and this is the KL divergence with the policy in the first argument, the target uh, distribution in the second argument. Um, you know, oops, uh, I'll come back to that maybe. Uh, a natural surrogate you might consider is what if you just flip the KL, okay? Now, okay, that sounds made up. We're just playing around. We flip the KL, okay? Uh, uh, one moment. Uh, but it does a couple of things nice for us. One thing is the KL divergence, by the way, uh, is a non-negative uh, cost function that is uh, only zero when pi equals P. And so if we flip the KL, we actually have preserved the global minimizer. Now, we've completely changed the landscape but the location of the optimal policy has not changed at all. This is actually another instance of taking a bad landscape and somehow magically building a convex, uh, well, sorry, I didn't say convex, but you know, building a convex uh, surface that preserves a global minimizer, okay? Um, how do we know that the reverse KL is convex? And you know, that's math, uh, but maybe, yeah, maybe I'll take the question. Yeah, P is this exponentiated reward distribution. So it's the distribution defined by the rewards against whom we're trying to optimize expected value. Okay. Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, so this seems like actually a promising training objective uh, distinct from uh, expected reward. Uh, okay, hang on. I, just let me preview what's coming next. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, it's arbitrary. Uh, maybe, uh, but let me connect it this way. So I can attempt some information theoretic argument, but instead of that, let me instead empower you with the space of things that are like this, but different. Um, so, uh, sorry. So we added this policy regularizer, entropy, okay? Another way we can think of this uh, problem, sorry, here, is a projection. So you take the reward vector, and we're trying to project it onto the simplex. So we're trying to say, what is a, a distri probability distribution that is sort of like the, the reward vector we're trying to optimize? Uh, what we're doing here is entropy projection, projection. We're trying to find the point in the probability simplex that minimizes like KL, okay? Uh, now, you can just change your notion of geometry and you can get other mappings or other projectors from reward vectors to policies. For example, Euclidean distance. So you could think of just the straight out Euclidean projector of a, of a reward vector to the simplex. Uh, this is sometimes called Salus entropy. Uh, what's interesting about the Euclidean projection is that it's sparse. The entropy projection is never sparse, right? We always have non-zero probabilities. The uh, L2 projection to a simplex may zero out. It may wind up on a face or a corner, right? It may zero out a bunch of po probabilities but it will preserve, right, some information about the rewards. 
Uh, once you realize you know, that that's the game, you can start just you know, playing around with different sort of projection distances. Now, I'll caution you, there's a couple things going on. One of the things going on, of course, is computational tractability, right? So you, don't, you, you can invent projections that are like really hard, like to actually compute. Okay, fine, but, uh, but I don't want to do that, right? Like, so you know, there is sort of a computational expedience side to it. Um, but there's a big space of projectors that you could actually consider here. That's not a direct answer to the question of why. Uh, and I'm, I actually have no confidence. I don't think I have a good why answer, and I'm not convinced I've seen in the field a good why answer. Um, I just know that if we don't do this and we go back to expected reward, we're in a lot of trouble. I do know that. Um, okay, fair enough. Good. Uh, not dead yet. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, let's. Okay, so let's just say we attempt this. Uh, um, you know, surrogate KL by flipping the KL. Kind of hacky, but let's let's just go with it. We know we preserve the global minimizer, and we know we've created a much better optimization task. Take my word for it, but I, like you can do, you can try this yourself, and we'll see some results shortly. Um, it does another interesting thing, uh, which is it is closely related to the maximum likelihood objective that we just saw and that you've already learned about in supervised learning, but it is not equivalent. And actually, that's an interesting thing, and I just want to share with you that this was a discovery that isn't that old. Um, so if we compare the maximum likelihood, what I mean is, let's go back to the reward vector being a zero one indicator. So a sparse vector that's all zero with a single one, okay? So that means when we take a dot product, say like Q dot R, all that is is Q on the, uh, on the argument, right? On the correct label. So it's the score on the correct label. The F of Q, I guess I haven't described yet, it's the log normalizer, the softmax. Anyway, the, the objective uh, for maximum likelihood really is a regularized score maximization. We're trying to minimize or you know, elevate the score on the correct action uh, with a regularizer F, okay? The KL is not quite the same. What it's taking is not R itself, it's taking P, which again is you take the R vector, you, you divide by temperature, you exponentiate and normalize, okay? Point being is that the, uh, the entropy projection R to P yields a P vector that is not sparse. So R is sparse, all zero, single one, but P is actually gonna have a non-zero probability everywhere and shrink the probability on the target a bit, okay? So for free, for better or worse, when we do this KL trick, what we've introduced is this thing called label smoothing or sometimes distillation or there's all kinds of folklore around it, but instead of like just maximizing the probability of the correct label, we're training to soft targets, okay? Turns out, training to soft targets, at least in a lot of object recognition and applications, is a free win for generalization. Not an overwhelming win, but you know, almost, uh, almost for free, you can improve your generalization error a little bit in almost you know, most contexts just by smoothing the labels a bit. And that's a side effect. So that's just this reverse KL uh, objective. So it's more trainable than the thing we care about, but we even get these potential side benefits of some generalization lift. Okay, anyway, I'm not here to be a salesman. I'm just trying to sort of share with you some of the things that I'm seeing like uh, when these fields intersect. Uh, yeah, and then in the zero temperature limit, they become equivalent. Uh, oh, last point, and uh, I'll just maybe skip it. So, well, okay, the reverse KL is a convex, uh, at least convex at the top layer, a convex surrogate for the target KL, but it's not an upper bound. But indeed, you can recover an upper bound by sort of uh, mixing the, uh, the reverse KL with some quadratic. The quadratic also has the same global minimizer. Uh, the nice thing about this is now you can do theory and you can prove like uniform convergence bounds and so on and so forth, and maybe get the NeurIPS reviewers to accept your paper. Uh, but, uh, you know, but it's really, it's more of a theoretical proxy, although in practice, when you start to realize that there are many components you can mix into a surrogate loss objective, uh, there are often some benefits. Uh, yes, sir? You call it the reverse KL, but it's more like the regular KL. Yeah, from supervised learning, yeah. Right. Yes. So Yashua is pointing out that reinforcement learning has the KL backwards. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, cool. And okay, cheesy experiment, uh, but you know, just this is you know somewhat real. So okay, 
None of my demonstrations, again, are towering edifices of demonstration glory. They're just like MNIST and CIFAR, okay? But, but you know, we can learn things there. Uh, and so if you just, you know, give it a run, right? You just take a, you know, a simple neural network and you train it on MNIST and you just, you know, try the different objectives. You do kind of, you see these phenomenon. If you try it yourself, you'll see something like this. For example, this thing here, sorry, uh, in, an optimization we want to minimize, right? So this objective here is one minus uh, accuracy or uh, training error, right? So if we use the training error objective to train, what we discover is you cannot get that training error to go to zero, okay? And you suffer some generalization error. Now, it's probably better than the least squares, you know, which has maybe a higher generalization. Here's our friend log loss, which is, you know, the machine learning 101 objective, which is not bad. It definitely gets the training error to zero. But we find that like label smoothing and, you know, maybe combining it with other terms can be beneficial. This is on a cheesy MNIST experiment. We tried something on a, you know, sort of a ResNet 20 CIFAR experiment and see somewhat similar things going on, although to be fair, uh, machine learning 101 log loss is pretty competitive and we barely eke out, I think, a generalization. It's almost imperceptible, but anyway, there it is. Um, I actually think this is real, okay. doing oh I'm, okay I'm cool uh, okay so that's it so uh, just summary yeah okay shot my mouth off but really all I want you to, to, to recall is when we go back to this picture we're trying to optimize a policy on a given set of data the choice of training objective is a choice okay and you can do what your you know professor or boss tells you to do but that's a baseline and then you can do better by thinking about like alternatives but it's a little bit of a subtle art, right? Because you want to preserve enough, you know, structure of the original objective, and you want to engineer the landscape to be more trainable. But computer scientists, machine learning engineers, that's what we should be doing. Okay. Uh, now I want to, uh, okay, now I want to move to the second issue, but yeah, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of been the pitch here. I guess, yeah, I think the, the, the reason that's a fair question, like it's really uncomfortable right now, is that, okay, to be fair, these particular experiments, the rewards are zero, one, so I want to say, of course, but these experiments don't answer that question, and I'm trying to think, like, we do have other experiments that, you know, for more general rewards, um, but they may not be in these slides. Let me just say yes and move on. Excellent question, yeah? Now, uh, you need importance correction. Uh, oh, sorry, here it's fully observed. Yeah, it's policy gradient. Policy gradient with fully observed rewards. It's not a good idea here. It's not gonna help you when the rewards start disappearing. Uh, good, yeah, that is, uh, okay, that is where I'm headed. Okay, so uh, just the next part of the story, you know, down in the sub-basement of RL is uh, to actually face the actual problem which is, uh, in addition to choosing the training objective, we actually have to cope with missing data. Even if you think you're ignoring missing data, you're actually assuming something there. Um, okay, so this, by the way, this picture is how supervised learning relates to RL. Way down in the sub-basement, when we strip away all of the complexities of sequential and exploration, blah, 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 we focus on policy optimization. That's what supervised learning does, but it does it with full data. And all we're doing now is considering that same problem where we have missing data, where we get a partial reward matrix, not a complete reward matrix, okay? So next issue, last issue uh, that I'll actually teach about is uh, how do we cope with missing data? Um, it's also healthy at this point to remind you that you've encountered missing data. I'm assuming mostly in, in like er, uh, initial machine learning courses, like you learned about graphical models and you learned about conditional probabilities and joint probabilities and marginal probabilities. And you were taught correctly to say, well, look, if I see some of the variables in a big graphical model, there is a conditional distribution over all the other variables. I didn't see the other variables, right? That is missing data inference. Condition on what you see, you want to make coherent inference about what you don't see. We, you know, we study this, okay? 
All I'm asking you to think about right now is when you study that, just to, to understand its relevance to reinforcement learning. Okay, so let's think about it in a reinforcement learning context, but really it's a uh, missing data problem. Okay, missing data inference. How are we gonna do this? I'm gonna start with a straw person, okay? Uh, here's a very simple idea, is that we just kinda hack our way out of the problem. So I give you this matrix, you, most of the rewards are missing, but what we're gonna do is we're just gonna guess. We're gonna fill it in, right? We're just gonna have some strategy or technique or algorithm that just fills in the matrix with stuff, and now declare it to be a full matrix, and then we just reduce the previous problem, solve, and we're off to the races, okay? We're just gonna reduce the partially observed problem to the fully observed problem, problem solved, okay? Uh, okay, that sounds naive, all right? It is naive. Um, you know, it's the baseline. But uh, what's, what's interesting is that this is naive, but it is actually dominating a lot of the current thinking, even in the current literature in reinforcement learning on how to solve this policy optimization problem. Here's what I mean. Let's go back to our, our friend, uh, importance corrected expected reward. So there's the formula from before. My claim is, is that that formula is actually doing this. It's actually filling in the rest of the data you haven't seen. Uh, and then using that as a complete data thing and now reducing it to the expected reward objective, which I don't recommend, but anyway, just you know, trying to solve that, okay? How is that the case? Because if you sort of break apart this formula, you can see it is mathematically equivalent to the following. What importance corrected expected reward does is it takes the, the few rewards you do see and it changes them. You know, why not, right? Like, anyway, it changes the things you do see and then it fills everything else with zero. Brilliant inference over the, the rewards you haven't seen. Fixes that, now it's complete data, now it's the full you know, policy gradient on full expected reward, and goes for it, okay? Uh, I mean, okay, what's to recommend this? One of the things you can use to recommend this is it is unbiased, okay? So it turns out we were very clever in rescaling the rewards. By the way, we're dividing by proposal probabilities, which means we exaggerate everything. We take the observations, we actually exaggerate them. Okay, fill in zeros everywhere else. Declare, you know, missing data inference uh, victory and, and move on. Uh, but we've rescaled the observed rewards just so when we think about the expected reward, like the expected uh, vector, so let's, let's look at, say, this top row. The expected vector you would have gotten if you considered how the estimator behaved in expectation. That is, okay, there was a certain probability you drew action A1 under beta, and then you divide it by beta, and now when we compute the expectation, you remultiply by beta, the beta cancels, and we've got R1 there, right? And R2 and R3. Uh, and so when we add these up, the expected estimate is the sum over the actions, the probability we chose the action of a one-hot indicator of an exaggerated reward on that action, the betas cancel, so now we're summing up a bunch of one-hot indicators scaled by the rewards, which is the underlying reward vector. It's unbiased. Okay, it's a horrific missing data estimation principle, but it's unbiased. So if you're a theoretician and you wanna prove things about expected rewards, yep, this is your friend, right? Like you, all your proofs about expectations, you know, start to look pretty simple. But in terms of algorithmic design or machine learning principles, like, come on, okay. So uh, there is like, you know, again, I mean, there's some work here, right? Like serious work on this problem. Uh, there is, nobody really recommends just straight out imports corrected expected reward. I think nowadays, like anytime you're doing it, you know you're cheating nature, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, but the thing that's sort of recommended isn't tons better, uh, but, you know, but it is better, is okay, instead of just filling in zeros on all the parts you haven't seen, what if you had a model? Like you have a model, there's a big neural net you're learning, maybe you want another neural net. What if you have a model that's looking at the, you know, the rewards in the data and uncovering latent structure and generalizing and then use that generalization ability to like fill in the data with like reasonable predictions about what the rewards would have been on these different actions in different contexts. Of course, that's what we should be doing. So we'll use a model to fill in the data. Now, uh, if, you, uh, if you, for whatever reason, need to constrain yourself to unbiased estimation, well, then you're gonna have to go through a bit of contortions about how you mix the model predictions with the observed rewards to get like all these expectations to work out, but it's actually straightforward. All you do is you just fill in the matrix with the guesses from your model, and then on the observed part, yeah, we're gonna perturb it again, but we're gonna perturb it by first taking the difference from your prediction, so the difference of your prediction in the true reward, and then rescale that. 
So exaggerate all the, the errors on the predictions and then fill in your model predictions. This is unbiased, okay? It's definitely better than, you know, option zero. Definitely reduces variance. You know, it is a better alternative. Um, and, yeah, and uh, it's, okay. Anyway, it's, it's viable, okay? I'll come back to uh, doing better shortly, but it's viable. It does raise some interesting questions. So now we can maybe start to have a uh, discussion that looks more like reinforcement learning. Where should the model come from? Now in RL, when you think about policies and you think about values, there is this sort of mindset that these are two different things. Therefore, there are two different models. So you have your neural network that's a policy and your neural network that's a value function. Okay. And now it's an actor critic thing and the actor's the policy and the critic's the value function. But this is one shot decision making. So that value function is actually just the reward function. Okay. So if you want to say where does the model come from, it comes from a value network. That value network, you have to train on the data. The typical thing, which is kind of reasonable but not great, is just to train the value network to minimize the squared prediction error of the rewards, just to straight out linear, uh, sorry, straight out least squares regression, okay? So fit a model to the rewards, squared regression, and then optimize the policy to the, uh, to the model, right? Use the model to complete the data, okay? That's okay, uh, but here's the thing about this, is in one-shot decision-making, the value function is independent of the policy. If you change the policy, it's the same value function. Which means if you think of this usual actor critic thing like existing in some uh, eternal loop where the actor improves the critic and vice versa, nope, one iteration. You estimate the value, it's the value for all policies, you optimize the policy, done, fixed point, okay? Uh, maybe it's a fine fixed point. It turns out this is okay, it kind of works. It's not great, it kind of works, okay? Uh, it certainly is a good sort of baseline. Um, Here's what we tried, and okay, I admit, you know, we're fighting with reviewers and so on and so forth, that's life. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things I've, uh, I've often liked about these kind of projection views of like mappings between rewards and probabilities or values and policies is a unification. What if we had just one model, one neural network? Uh, and I, my, my argument is that's actually somewhat liberating in this context. We take that one neural network that was our policy, and we just look at the top layer, and we notice that we have both things there. We have a neural network that predicts scores across rewards. Let's think of those scores as uh, a reward estimates, a regressor. But that same neural network, when you convert by like scaling, exponentiating, normalizing, is now a policy. It's the same model, okay? Uh, if we think of this as unified, then when we start to like, you know, kind of monkey around with all our uh, alternative objectives, we kind of just apply those objectives for free. We just pull gradients through the objective. It goes through our one model. There's no messing around with like different models and so on and so forth. It just, it just works, okay? It works mathematically. Um, okay, so we've actually sort of probed around a bit with this sort of unified approach where we just have one model. It's both actor and critic or policy and uh, value function. There is some mathematical subtlety about the values being, uh, the value to policy mapping being shift invariant. Uh, but other than that, we can sort of just plug it right into the surrogates and train. Uh, oh, sorry, this isn't just about us. I'm just sort of advocating for a perspective, right? Uh, this allows us to take all of the previous discussion about, you know, sort of engineering the training objective and applying it here in the context of missing data. So we can take these imputation strategies and just compose them with the optimization objectives on a single model like we had before, and it just works mathematically. So it's just a simple, more sort of factorized view, okay? Anyway, I'm just saying, I think it's valuable to at least think about things this way. So uh, we try it, ah, yeah, and uh, just wanna point out that this actually kinda works. Um, so these are just repeating the same experiments from before, but okay, like the small charts below are just copies of the previous fully observed charts, uh, but if we just take the same data, like, you know, MNIST and CIFAR, and then instead of like giving you the full zero one reward vector, what if we do the following silly, silly thing? We just take our behavior strategy, which just uniformly at random reveals one label per image. So you wanna train MNIST and then you, you, know, you have an image of something and then you reveal three and you get a zero, it's not three. And then you take another image, you reveal four and you get a one, like, ooh, that's a four. But you only get one, which means in your training data, you, only one tenth of it is positive, nine tenths are negative in expectation. Okay, so it's sort of significantly reduced data, 
But when you take the significantly reduced data and then you start to train like these alternative objectives, I admit the, the differences get smaller, we actually start to see some noticeable benefits. Um, okay, so uh, here is expected reward. I know I've been complaining about it, but expected reward with like this doubly robust imputation, okay, it's not terrible, all right? Uh, nobody's getting the reward, uh, the training error to zero. By the way, the training error is measured with respect to the unrevealed full vector, okay? So no, you can't like magically impute the correct answer everywhere in the matrix, okay? But you can do fairly well and generalize, and actually I think these are astonishingly, astonishingly good results once you look at the y-axis. So if I give you just that one-tenth of the data to train on, and then we optimize the neural net, say, using uh, you know, these various objectives, we're getting somewhere from 4 to 2.5% test error, okay? That's in a model that, if you saw everything, gets 1.5% test error. Put another way, at this end of the, of the spectrum, the, uh, just given that sparse data, the neural network is generalizing well enough to be less than a factor of two worse than the thing that saw all the data. Point being, if you do RL well, it is magical. Neural networks really generalize. Now, this is cheating. You know, MNIST is easy, but the neural network is able to uncover the structure that explains this data amazingly well, to the point where it almost can recover the same solution as if you saw everything. Okay? Now, it's a bit overselling, right? You know, things get a bit more challenging in CIFAR, but we still see, you know, if we engineer the objective a fair amount, we are, again, within about a factor of two of the um, test accuracy training on fully observed labels. Uh, just to make a point. Okay, so I'm going to move along, but I saw half hands up, so I should take that as, on average, one hand? <laughs> yeah. Missing. So uh, uh, there's an MNIST image. There's 10 class labels. Just line them up as 1 to 10 or 0 to 9, I'm sorry. Uh, and then I just reveal one of them. It's 0 in position 4. It means this image is not a 4. That's all you get. And then this image maybe is a 1 in the 2 position. This image is a 2. Uh, sorry, say again. All of it. I mean, just, just draw one action per, one label per image. So one-tenth is missing, but it's sort of structured. It's not like semi-supervised, where maybe I take 10% and reveal everything, and then reveal nothing about the rest. This is actually a, a form of semi-supervised learning, by the way, but uh, it's just, it's sparse everywhere. Yeah? It's a natural problem, at least the structure of the problem. Yeah, it's competitive. <laughs> <laughs> As it should be, right? I mean, you can, yeah, yeah. I, I'm making an educational point. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Um, I think, okay, I, I have to land this thing, but I'm getting close. So let me just make one more attempt at uh, teaching something that I think relates the nature of this problem to things that you already have learned about uh, and integrates knowledge a little bit. Uh, okay, so, okay, back to missing data, for real, okay? Uh, if we just ignore for a moment this whole, like, reinforcement learning context and just said, look, look, you know, if we have, like, you know, all these conditional observations and we've only seen a bit of it, you know, don't we really at some point want to do the right thing? Well, what is the right thing? Uh, okay, you know, th that's another big argument, but I, I would say, look, you know, the right thing to do when all else is unclear is, is that we just pretend to be Bayesian, okay? What if we actually allowed ourselves to build a generative model over this data? Um, and, okay, here's my little generative model. You may not have noticed it, but, you know, let's imagine instead of, uh, okay, let's imagine the neural network uh, is a generator of the data that we see. How can the neural network be a generator of the data? Well, let's say it emits, you know, at that output layer, a bunch of scores, but in, instead of thinking of those scores directly as value estimates, what if we think of those scores as like hyperparameters for a, a distribution that's gonna generate the data? So to be more, uh, maybe more concrete here, what if we, for example, go to a continuous action case and you see a single action, and I wanna use like, say, a Gaussian generative model, okay? 
okay? So uh, I can uh, have my neural network emit, you know, say a vector of means uh, or some parameters that are gonna be used to determine means and maybe another vector or matrix of things used to determine covariances. But my neural network is trained to emit hyperparameters. The hyperparameters now define a joint distribution over parameters, which are the psi here, okay? Uh, and it's latent. We don't see the psi variables. We have these latent variables. And then the psi's, are, are these random variables, generate the observed rewards. What's the value to this one level of indirection? Well, the value to this one level of indirection is we can now do sort of prior posterior updating on the data. So we have a generative model of how the rewards got generated, but we didn't see uh, everything. So let's say we're in a continuous action setting. We have this context, there's a full you know, continuum of actions we could have taken. We only chose a single action, like a delta spike, and we observed a reward there, okay? Now, before we get caught up in the likelihood, a priori in this generative model, we would have had a prior distribution over functions, over reward functions, right? We could have sampled from the prior, we could generate like, you know, functions from that prior, okay? And now, when we see the data, you know, Bayes' rule tells us how to formulate coherently a posterior distribution over functions given the prior in the data, okay? Um, so what happens if we just give this a run? Um, well, one of the things that's slightly disturbing about this is that, okay, so, um, oh, maybe one further step. So we have the prior, we have the likelihood function, and then we formulate a posterior, and if everything, for example, happened to be linear and Gaussian, we could get like this closed form uh, Gaussian posterior, which I, um, I think Roger even showed uh, you guys last week, so that's cool. Um, we wanna go one step further. This is the posterior over the parameters, like the Gaussian distribution over parameters given the data. Uh, we actually want the predictive distribution, which is the posterior distribution over the full, you know, an arbitrary reward given the, the observed reward. So we have to integrate out this latent variable. Anyway, in, in you know, Gaussians, it's all closed form. So we get the predictive distribution. If you insisted that I now drop out of being Bayesian and just give you a function, the function beforehand could have been the prior mean function, and the function after seeing the data would be the posterior mean function, okay? Uh, and it will do a very natural form of imputation, which is it'll take this observed reward here, and then, you know, maybe we had a prior, which was sort of like this, and then we get some posterior, which maybe shifts, you know, the mass to explain the data a bit better, okay? Uh, because uh, we're doing this Bayesian inference only at the output layer of the neural net, we still want the underlying neural network itself to uncover explanatory structure in the data that it then uses to kind of set up the prior that generates things that explain the data, okay? So, uh, okay, it's a bit indirect, but the way that I've sort of contemplated or I'm sort of proposing at least initially to kind of use this apparatus as an incomplete data mechanism is empirical base, okay? So we, uh, we think of the neural network as one big massive hyperparameter. We're gonna optimize it, you know, by pulling gradients through its outputs. And then we're gonna do proper Bayesian inference over the latent parameters. We're gonna get a prior, we'll get a posterior, and now we just wanna you know, choose a loss function or an objective through which we can pull gradients to train the hyperparameters in the neural network. The, the canonical default way to think about this is called empirical Bayes whenever you're sort of optimizing part and integrating part. Um, but we've done it in a controlled way where the integration part is, is controlled and tractable and then the optimization kind of becomes a standard thing for us. Uh, the marginal likelihood here is none other than a form of least squares regression with a little bit of bias and a little bit of scaling, okay? So it kind of drops down into something that we, are, we already, actually was already there in some of the charts, like least squares, okay? A little bit better, but effectively least squares. But what's interesting here is that we can also now think of other sort of uh, generalizations of empirical Bayes, other objectives where we think of more general uh, spaces of objectives that can still exploit this missing data inference, but still can just create a, a loss function that we can pull gradients through to train the neural net, the two obvious ones that I'm just pitching here as a, as a simple case study are KL divergences between the prior and the posterior. Um, this seems a bit weird, it took me a while to get my head around it, then it took me even longer to convince anyone to listen to me, and now we'll see if I can ever convince reviewers, but uh, the, uh, you know, so minimize the KL between the prior and the posterior. Notice what victory means here. Victory means that we've actually got that KL to zero, which would mean we've optimized the parameters of the neural net, 
to produce a, a, a hyperparameter that once it sees the data, doesn't update anymore. It's already knew the data. It's kind of weird, okay? Uh, but if you do it in this one orientation, the KO between the posterior and the prior, it's actually also mathematically equivalent to an estimate of minimizing the mutual information between the latent parameter as a random variable and the observed data as a random variable. And again, zero is when the, uh, there is no mutual information, which means our distribution has already explained everything that we're going to get out of the data. Okay. Uh, anyway, because it's Gaussian, one moment, uh, because it's Gaussian, we, all these things have closed forms and you can pull gradients through them and train neural nets. And so we can use a richer form of latent variable estimation in the context of policy optimization. Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, well, uh, okay, it works just great because I cheat. I'm never gonna build the full covariance. So the, okay, so this, the dimensionality of interest here is the dimensionality of the action space. So if the action space is a continuum but one dimensional, it's totally trivial. If, you, if you're dealing with like thousand dimensional continuous actions, like that's a pretty elaborate robot already. You know, often we're dealing with control spaces, dozens of dimensions and so on and so forth. Even if you could solve that, by the way, you've got a job. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, once we're up into thousands or tens of thousands, it'll become an issue, but look, we just cheat. We deal with the diagonal covariance, and so it's not actually, it's not computationally much overhead, really. Um, okay, anyway, just as a proof of concept, oh, by the way, this lecture did kind of subtly, you know, lapse into researchy level kinds of things. Uh, you would actually hope that in the sub-basement that wasn't the case, that it was all sorted out, like the boiler room is all plumbed up and it all works. Uh, sorry, anyway, okay. So, uh, you know, so here's just, uh, again, just as a demonstration, uh, you know, I didn't have that much time. Uh, you know, MNIST experiment, continuous action MNIST. Imagine, just for the sake of argument, you think of a 10-dimensional continuous action space MNIST problem. What could that be? Well, build target vectors for each image, right? So each image has to emit the target indicator vector. And then take a random exploration strategy that picks a random indicator vector that doesn't necessarily match the target indicator vector. Call that uh, a behavior strategy. And then take that sort of guessed vector, add Gaussian noise to it. Produce a, a random sort of uniform Gaussian vector. And then your reward is simply the squared Euclidean distance to the hidden target vector you never saw. So you take MNIST, you see a one-dimensional scalar reward for each image, but you actually had to, you saw 10-dimensional action vectors that you're scoring. And now our policy has got a map from an image to actually 20 dimensional vector, actually 22 dimensional, but anyway, 10 dimensions and offsets and uh, another for variance, okay? If you just do reinforce, you know, importance corrected, expected reward minimization, in this context, it fails quite badly. Like, I guess it, okay, it didn't diverge. It's not gonna diverge, but it, uh, it actually was not able to fit the data very well, explain the data, and it wasn't able to generalize well. Uh, pretty much anything we do with a Bayes estimator, so here, this is like vanilla, classical, empirical Bayes estimations, pretty good. Uh, these KL variations are actually both pretty good. In fact, if I could get rid of this stuff, you could start to see only subtle differences, and I claim, like, if you do the mutual information thing, it's a little bit better than the rest, but anyway, that's probably just noise. Uh, Point being is if you do sort of reasonable latent variable inference, it looks to me like actually, yeah, I mean, uh, those are reasonable principles. They complete the data in a reasonable way. And if you use that as a target for training, you actually do better than this kind of like, nope, 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 let's just target expected reward and only do that, okay? Uh, there is, however, an awkwardness about this, which is, and this is the other catch, oops. The other catch, oh, have I lost it? is that Bayes' estimation is always biased. It's biased. Bias is your friend. And whenever I get into a heated argument in a hallway, you know, at some conference or something, I try to remember, remind people about the story about Stein shrinkage. You should all know about Stein shrinkage. It doesn't solve all problems, but there's a lesson, which is biased estimation uh, isn't just guessing and then win when you're right and lose when you're wrong. Proper biased estimation, like proper Bayesian inference with sort of proper optimization and integration, at least in some isolated contexts, provably dominate the naive estimators. In the sense that even if your prior is wrong, 
uh, the weighted sort of regularization you get out of proper inference still gets you a better expected test error than you would have gotten by trying to have an unbiased estimator. Bias is your friend if you can control it. Okay. Anyway, uh, I don't want to sell that too hard. It's just like, okay, uh, we probably want biased estimators. When in doubt, start with Bayes, make it tractable. You know, that, okay. Uh, so uh, that's it. That's the story. Um, so down in the sub-basement of RL, we just want to optimize our policies given, you know, partial data. Uh, we indeed want to leverage the generalization capacity of neural networks, but there is an art and science to choosing the, uh, the objectives and how we manage missing data. This is the thing that connects reinforcement learning to most of your other foundations in machine learning and statistics. It's just not there in the way we teach either subject. Um, interesting. Uh, and, and it's still research active. So, uh, sorry, don't take anything I'm saying as the final word on anything. I'm just trying to alert you that you know a lot of things that are relevant, but you're not being told they're relevant, so you treat them as they're irrelevant. We are trapped by the way we think about problems. Try not to be trapped, right? If it doesn't look right, it's not right. Like, you know, think about it. Okay. Uh, okay, just to end, I can't resist. Okay, actually, I do like to work on RL, and I, like, I'm actually working on RL for reals. Uh, which would mean like, you know, sequential decision making, blah, blah, blah. Of course, I can't tell that story right here. Uh, but, you know, we have three different bets going on, like approximate dynamic programming, which you should never do unless you know what you're doing. Uh, using these techniques in a sequential setting looks exciting, looks promising, but like I can't sort of portray big victories yet, but we've got like toy demos. Uh, I think the coherence actually will work. Uh, and if you're really thrown off by the deadly triad, you can always just go to the dual where everything's a joint distribution and life is great. If only you can solve the MCMC problem. Uh, anyway, uh, stuff. Um, I want to uh, actually end, and I know this is bad form, but just, just a small advertisement. I had people last week to my face tell me that Google is not in Edmonton. It's like to my face, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, sort of, like so, okay. I do work for Google Brain. We are interested in hiring. And yes, I'm on a, a wonderful young fundamental uh, research team that's based in Edmonton, Seattle, and Mountain View. If you're interested in any of those sites, maybe Edmonton in particular, uh, you know, please talk to me. Uh, we are always looking for people who are a good fit. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Alberta. Fantastic place to do a PhD. Just ask, you know, Dave Silver, Mark Belmar, whatever, uh, Martha. Uh, and, of course, I'd like to thank Amy for uh, actually all the immense work they've been putting into pulling this event together. Uh, and with that, thank you. Uh. Thanks, boss. Oh, I, I, I was almost out of here, but then Pascal's in the room. Okay. Yes? So what is the applied drop half that you believe should be built as missing data uh, for a group by group example? And do drop half at the same time consider missing reason form or interest? And are all of the majority of the DL or majority of the data considered to be missing the group of Yeah, yeah, wow, so Pascal, th that, like, that's an amazingly cool question. Uh, I'm probably gonna twist it into something I wanna answer. Uh, okay, partly what sounded cool, but I would never have thought of this, is that you, it sounded like you're gonna take complete reward information and then you're gonna actually drop some of it and put us back into this desperately hard situation of like missing data. And, and if we can wrangle around that, Maybe we'll get a, a generalization benefit back in the original. Like, that would be amazing. Like, I'd love to tell that story. But you actually think that could work? Like, I... Well, so, I mean, you have evidence that missing yeah. is a very hard thing. Maybe you look at... Well, that's awesome. That's a better advertisement than my entire presentation. That's great. Yeah, I'd like, uh, yeah, let's, I'd like to follow up on that. Uh, cool. Uh, okay, one more question. One or zero? 
Zero it is. Oh. Chaba. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's an excellent question. So, of course, it was lucky. There's selection bias, right? I wouldn't have shown the experiment. Anyway. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think this is, like, I think the, the, I think it's conceivable that we could, you know, work out some theory that explains why this has to work. Uh, you know, under whatever assumptions, like, you know, if we accept, say, the Gaussian assumption was somehow true and so on and so forth. I think it's not that bad, right? Because the, uh, for example, if we go back to Stein estimation, right? Like we can prove like this domination. We can prove like the expected squared prediction error of this like adaptively regularized estimator dominates the, the unbiased estimator. Uh, quantifying that gap is not work I've seen done, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's out there. But that, I, I feel like partly you're asking for a much more detailed analysis of like how can we quantify that gap, you know, in terms of like uh, finite sample guarantees and so on and so forth. I think already there, that sounds interesting to me, may already be known. If it's already known, I just want to rip it off and apply it here. I think, I, I mean, I think the path is there, but I'm not aware, like I haven't done it and I'm, I, I doubt I ever could, but like I, I, I'm not aware of an end-to-end -end argument. I think that's a legitimate uh, pursuit, yeah. Okay, I'm out of here. Thanks. Thanks.